Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and if you play Dungeons & Dragons, and especially old-school Dungeons & Dragons, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel, and now we'll move on to the video. Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and I'm here with Kyle Chenier, and uh, we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that he's done recently, some of the stuff he's planning on doing in the future. Um, let's uh, start. Kyle, say hello to everybody, and then we're going to talk about uh, uh, the various things you're working on. Hey, what's up? Uh, I'm Kyle Chenier. Um, I'm predominantly known, I guess, for uh, my book, Blood and the Chocolate, for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Uh, it won the Gold Award for Best Adventure at the 2017 Annie Awards. Um, I also have a blog, Dungeons and Donuts, uh, where I do a lot of old school and new school role-playing game stuff on there. And I also have a bunch of other sort of old school books out there too. And after having, I, I just want to let everyone know that I do check with everyone on how to pronounce their name at the beginning, and then I proceeded to screw it up. It's Shenyang. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it's all good. Um, okay, so uh, let's uh, first first off, anyone not familiar with the Any Awards, the Gold Any Award is like super prestigious and and is uh, you know uh, vicious competition to get uh, something up at that level on things. So congratulations on a Gold. Thank you. Award. Right. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's super refreshing because like Blood and the Chocolate is sort of my first sort of bigger budget, um, sort of more official kind of publication. Like I self published a bunch of things before then, but this is my first. This was my first book working for a an actual role playing game company, like working with James Ratchie with LOTFP. Like that was my first big project. So to have that book come out, be really well received, and then to win an award that following year. It's huge. Like it's 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 really great. Yeah, and now you'll have people asking for your autographic conventions and all of that oh, stuff, and you'll have. I don't know about yeah, that, but yeah, you will. And so you'll have to go through the whole imposter syndrome <laughs> thing that that, that uh, many of us do. And we, I, I get that, and it's still weird. Um, so let's talk um, first of all about uh, Blood in the Chocolate, and like you mentioned, it's a Lamentations of the Flame Princess adventure, which means. Mm. Um, that it is going to require very, very little conversion um, to yeah. the other OSR systems. It'll go almost seamlessly into Swords and Wizardry and Original D&D. It'll go very, very easily into basic, a little bit more work required for first or second uh, editions. But, you know, basically it's 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 in there in the zone. And, mm -hmm. um, of course, it you know, works for Lamentations. Um, let's talk about it. It's set in the... Uh, uh, in in Jim Raggi's sort of quasi real world only horrific uh, yeah. you know sort of setting. Talk about how you integrated it with that. So I'm a huge fan of Lamentations of Flame Princess, like air quotes official setting of sort of off kilter weird fantasy uh, 17th century Europe um, because it allows you to integrate a ton of interesting historical events and. Uh, uh, places and peoples from history um, while also integrating a tremendous amount of like really great horror stuff. Um, Blood and the Chocolate is set in Friesland in 1617. Um, I believe it's 1670. It might be 1612. I should know. I wrote it. but <laughs> um, And the premise of the adventure is that uh, chocolate, uh, as sort of we would modern, uh, modernly conceive it of uh, sort of modern day chocolate has become incredibly popular in Europe among the nobility and the aristocrats. And it now, let's stop right there. Uh, let's stop mm. right there for just a moment, because I don't want you to give away uh, too much too fast on the concept that we're, that I want to talk about. And the concept that I want to talk about is taking um, is something that's been done a whole lot in D and D, which is taking a work of fiction mm -hmm. and then working that into an adventure and it's been done very well in some situations and it's been done very badly in some situations with the right. example of uh the uh the old tsr alice in wonderland modules not usually seen as being all that great um but then on the other hand looking at the jim raggi uh you know opus we've also got red and pleasant land which is a version of alice oh, absolutely. in wonderland yeah uh, and that version of alice in wonderland uh, you know i think is fantastic most people love it or they hate it. I'm one of the people that loves it in that group. Me too. Now, Alice in Wonderland has got some fairly sinister underlying connotations and things, um, which uh, which Zach 
amplified a great deal. Mm -hmm. And the author, um, Roald Dahl, I think, has much, much more sinister connotations <laughs> in a lot of the things that he writes. Oh, yeah. And so now let's talk about, you know, the uh, the chocolate factory issue that people probably when I say chocolate factory, they'll get to what it is that you've got as, as some of the un some of the underlying underpinnings here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, what do you mean? Like sort of like just sort of talk about the chocolate factory or? Well, no, I mean, the, the, the thing being that, um, you, one of the, one of the strong influences on here that's, that's pulled in is Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, it is similar to Zach's Red and Pleasant Land in the sense that it takes a piece of children's literature that has sinister connotations mm -hmm. and then you've amplified those sinister connotations you've also added a lot of other things too like you know the link to a real world or you know the 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 real world of lamentations right um so talk uh talk a little bit first about how you merged those various concepts of here is a a work of fiction here is jim raggi's uh you know default campaign mm -hmm. how did you how did you put all of that together what was the process oh i mean it wasn't hard so Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl is an incredibly colonialist English book. Like that book is in its original form is marinated in both uh, sort of English folk tales and also uh, it's sort of rife with a lot of elements of colonialism. So I just made those a little more literal. Um, whereas when Roald Dahl take them, it was very sort of sing songy and eventually when people complained about the original depictions of the Oompa Loompas as uh, basically straight up Bushmen. Uh, and then they were later changed with uh, Quentin Blake's later illustrations so that they were seen as a much more fantastical, magical people. Um, I just straight up literalized it and everything in order to really uh, capitalize that because it makes it far more horrific. And again, the idea of if I'm gonna make a adventure that prominently features a factory as an adventure site. Like, I'm going to go all in on that. I'm going to have allusions to uh, the Industrial Revolution and how, like, grim and dire those, uh, those times were in terms of dealing with the dangers of actually working in a factory. And on top of that, like, Blood and the Chocolate is, uh, them it has a thematic through line about uh, the evils of capitalism and corporate greed, and that by playing it, you are still complicit in doing all of those things, even when you are doing good in that adventure. And now that might sound like it's a, a political statement, but the the module itself doesn't come across as a political statement at all, because what it does is it sort of pulls, uh, you know, the when, when you're talking about literal colonialism, you're talking about this is the colonial age and there's actually something that's been moved from the new world into Europe to be uh, taken advantage of. You've mm -hmm. got, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, corporate greed, you've actually you've got a villain behind this. It's not so much the system of it. It's the question of whether the characters are going to one of the possibilities is they basically just take that villain's place. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, so that the description you're giving there of the, of the process is, is not necessarily the, uh, description of the end result, which comes across, you know, basically as being, um, it's, it's an adventure with a lot of depth to it and the areas where you've got depth to it. Um, because of it being in the default world, because of working from the fiction, you know, a lot of those those end results don't necessarily reflect the thinking process that went into them. You come out with something new at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say that, again, like any uh, D&D or any similar game adventure and everything, like it is very much what you make of it. Um, but again, as the author, like those things were absolutely present and intended. Um, but again, like any adventure, like, those kinds of stories are told through play, right? Like what I've written is just a part of it. And then it depends on where game masters and referees take it from there. Um, but yeah, I kept, I kept the iconography of like the 1971 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory film, uh, far more than the book, to be honest. Um, because I found through research that that was the version of that story that seemed to hold up the best. 
Um, cause the original book is great and I have a lot of appreciation for it. Um, but it didn't age especially well, I found. And it also, as much as I liked it, there was a lot that really, it didn't stick with me the same way that the 1971, um, film did, uh, with Gene Wilder. Um, and then of course, like a lot is also taken from the, uh, I believe it's 2006, uh, Tim Burton film as well. Um, like the, the brutalist architecture of the outside of the factory is something I absolutely drew inspiration on, um, in terms of how Lucia de Castillo's factory is designed in the book. And then don't, you know, again, um, for anybody who's, you know, listening to this, when we're talking about a factory, we're not talking about like a modern, um, sort of, you know, this is, this is not just placed in time. It works perfectly, um, in the early 1600s, Friesland, uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of the way that it's, it's brought in. There's no, uh, when, when I, when I looked at it, I did not feel like there was any sort of strained, um, attempt to put things together in sort of the same way that when you look at the old TSR, um, Alice in Wonderland stuff. I mean, you can just feel the strain of of, of working the stuff in there. Mm -hmm. But um, when in Blood in the Chocolate, it's all it's all put together. I mean, you see you see words like factory, you see words like chocolate. Um, but when you get into it, um, it is uh, it, it is not in, in any way a, a sort of strained um, effort to put these things together. It, it works extremely well. So well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you think so. I actually, I put a lot of work to make sure that it, uh, that, that it felt sort of, if not historically accurate, that it at least felt historically appropriate. Um, because again, like modern chocolate didn't exist in the 17th century. That didn't come along till the mid to late 18th century, but with the way it, it's sort of like something from a modern conception of the future and everything has been taken into the past and made before its time. And it has had a catastrophic um, sort of impact in that earlier time period. Like Lucy de Castillo, the, uh, the chocolatier and everything has made uh, the equivalent of modern day chocolate. And it drives in the uh, nobles and aristocrats of Europe, like half mad for this stuff. Suddenly it's this tremendous luxury good that is priced higher than liquor and spice and tea. And it changes the way that trade happens. And to facilitate this, she has a sort of proto industrial revolution factory. It's all, uh, paddle wheels and like hand cranks and like hand cranked conveyors as opposed to like steam or coal powered uh, devices and everything. It's all like hand done by a, a workforce of essentially slaves. Because like, again, through that time period, that is sort of how that would be done kind of. Um, so I'm glad you think that it fit, it fits better and it feels like it fits better. Oh, it definitely does. And I really, I, I, I really liked, you know, the standard version of here's something from the future that we're going to sort of add magic to and then put it earlier on is usually something like a ray gun uh, or a biological weapon. And in your case, it's the chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like the creativity that's involved in not pulling in something that seems huge uh, at first glance. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm also like I I'm a huge fan of of sinister and evil things being presented as just sort of like utterly banal. Um, like the, the insidiousness of something incredibly ordinary. Um, and yeah, and if you can, if you can get your players to mistrust chocolate, like that's, an, I feel like that's an accomplishment. One of the things that struck me is that, um, you've done, um, You've done something that has one of the dynamics of um, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which mm. is difficult to do because Expedition to the Barrier Peaks um, relies upon the characters not knowing exactly what it is that they are seeing in terms of technology. And in that one, it's pretty easy because it's far future. Yeah. But in yours, you know, you've got the um, the environmental risks and so on and so forth of the factory um, only you've uh, you've managed to do it just through uh, without relying on here are some pictures of high technology. You know, you've just put you, it, it's a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And yeah, people may not be able to see where the, where those dangers are at, at first glance. 
Yeah, uh, systems that sort of have to be designed to imply uh, the amount of danger of, say, working uh, or moving your way through like a factory floor where there are like gears constantly moving and there are blades chopping. And uh, so to handle that, it was sort of made as like an environmental effect. Like, okay, if you're going to go through this, you're going to have to make a saving throw in order to to pass through safely. Otherwise, you, you might lose a finger because that, that shit happened all the time. So there we've got, I think, a general picture of Blood in the Chocolate. And if you could send me, um, when we're done, just send me the RPG Now link or you know whatever the, the best sales link would be. And I'll put that in the description underneath the video. Right at this point, I still haven't gotten approved by YouTube to put links in embedded in the video itself oh, yeah. so if you can no worries I'll, uh, I'll pass that along and also you can find also, it by going to uh lotfp.com uh slash store i believe it is okay very good and then also to uh, uh dungeons and donuts and we'll just get all of that stuff in there no worries talk about um so we've we've got the uh the image of that you know gold any award winning uh what are you what are you working on next oh man i got I have so many things in the pipeline right now. Um, right now, the most immediate thing is I have a, a new independently published uh, book coming out, hopefully uh, by the end of January. It's called Weird on the Waves. Uh, it's a independent supplement for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. And again, similar old school elf games. Um, it is a wave crawl setting book and toolkit. Um, it's set in the mid 1600s and is basically a very different take on pirates and uh, uh, buccaneers and wave crawling. Because um, I love those things, but every time, every time I look up people sort of air quotes pirate settings, it's all the same tired tropes over and over. And like, if you've played it once, you've played it a thousand times. And those are good, but it's hard to. I've always found that it's difficult to like continue playing in those for an extended period of time. They're a nice break, but if you're going to set an entire campaign, like you need something more than just our pirates treasure. Like, Oh, we might have to fight a giant whale or an octopus. Oh, what kind of monsters do you have? And you're saying, Oh, we have uh, ghost pirates and skeleton pirates and a Kraken. And it's like, who right. gives a shit? <laughs> like I'm so done with that stuff. I wanted to make something that felt that felt suitably unique and sort of horrifying, um, but in a different context. Like, th okay, this might be um, incredibly big-headed of me to say, um, and I feel like this creates a huge expectation, but like what v Patrick Stewart's Veins of the Earth uh, did for moving underground and spelunking uh, my hope is that Weird on the Waves will do that for moving through the ocean. I'll definitely look forward to looking at that because, especially when you say that it's a, that you're using some toolkit mm. um, methodology, uh, toolkits are always awesome. So, uh, look forward to seeing toolkits for doing something that will uh, be able to add more to the pirate trope because mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. That's a, that's a really, that's a lot of fun uh, for a couple of sessions. And, and then, but you know, once you've done the Kraken and the ghost pirates, you run into the difficulties of, you know, what's, what's out there that's, that's new for pirates. Mm -hmm. so. Well, so it's, it, it's one thing where everyone has a take on it, but they're not all that different. And I figure like, that's something that's already been thoroughly done to death. I want to do something that if it's not new, it at least feels unique. Um, while, while still sort of being faithful to uh, sort of our conception of like very early buccaneers and uh, what life was like moving through the Caribbean and sort of privateers and buccaneers sort of uh, besieging trade ships uh, in and around those areas. Now, when you start, um, let, let's talk a little bit about the design process that you're working on with that, because I've talked um, with a bunch of people about the design process for uh, what you do with uh, an adventure, getting mm -hmm. advice from people about, you know, how do you come up with ideas? How do you structure it? So let me ask you this question in terms of um, structuring a toolkit. 
talk about how you're structuring the toolkit unless that is such a vague question that it's unanswerable. No, I can I can I can actually answer that pretty succinctly. Um, so uh, LOTFP is still my primary um, sort of basis for a lot of old school gaming. And uh, thankfully, some of the best toolkits that have ever been produced uh, have been produced through them. Um, when I go around structuring, like, what what would we need? What, what would I need for, like, making a toolkit for this kind of setting? Like, I always look back to Vornheim, the complete city kit, mm -hmm. because yep. uh, Zach Sabbath cleverly uh, came up with literally everything that you would need to run a city in a hurry. And the structure of that book is applicable to almost every other kind of setting in terms of tables like what do we what do you find if you look through a body uh we need a bunch of npcs what do they do what are they like um how can you generate them very very quickly um how do interactions between uh different npcs go um what's the name of this random place we just stumble across um and from there like having that sort of uh simple structure through that book like oh i could i could use these a uh, bunch of these things and from there it's like well what would i need if or what would other players need as well uh if they're going to be like wave crawling around well okay what happens on a ship like what random occurrences so we need a dynamic weather system so there's like two tables for what happens with weather there's um a handful of tables for generating uh sea encounters uh where you you uh, have a, a die drop table for um, ocean hexes. So you can just dump a bunch of dice onto this hex and it will generate things going on along with the weather and along with um, various weird conditions and the percentage and odds of like treasure that might come up in like if you pass any ships. Um, and doing it in a way where it's fast and it's easy because it's great to come up with a whole bunch of random tables, but if those aren't easy to use like in the moment on the fly, you might as well just make something up. Like it takes less time. So I've been really trying to design stuff that is like really fast and really snappy. Mm -hmm. well, and that's and that is a um, that is a very difficult thing to do. Anybody who has it, never, it's tough. Yeah, anyone yeah. who has never tried to design. Uh, tables. There's there's an awful lot more to it than just making a list and then putting numbers to it. Because when you start figuring out, well, I should, I could have this nested here, nested in this, nested in this, nested in this, and then you're like, yeah, it's going to take a half an hour mm -hmm. to get through all those nests. Do I want to do something where I'm sacrificing some of those entries? Do I want to do it, you know, using multiple dice all at once? There's there's a lot of different strategies for putting together tables that operate well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's um, you know, that's always an interesting question. It's usually a difficult question to ask because you're not necessarily going to be using the same method for the same problem, That which yeah. is another reason why you often see tables that are structured, you know, in the same book, and you've got tables that are radically differently structured, and the reason being what it is that they're trying to, to produce. Mm -hmm. so. And, like, I, I have a visual design background, so, like, I, I'm a big fan of die drop tables, especially because it allows you to have a large amount of concise visual information uh, that you can also add with dice. So it gives you basically everything you need on one or two pages. Uh, that way you're not constantly flipping forth between like essentially what amounts to lists. Because like, I look at a whole bunch of those, my eyes just glaze over. Um, so it's been, it's been a real challenge to be able to design stuff that is um th that holds up as useful i guess yeah and then and funnily enough i i've, I've just a couple days ago did an interview um you know with zach smith and um which and i don't know whether this one's going to come out first or whether that one's going to come out first but um you essentially duplicated um something that he said in there which is that you can use visual information to compress um a great deal more information it was funny to watch him struggle so hard to avoid saying a picture's worth a thousand words and finally he just gave up and said a picture's worth a thousand words it's, it's <laughs> true though i mean like it's um so with blood and the chocolate like that's 
that's something I took to heart is like every example of art in that book is illustrative of a situation that the players will find themselves in or come across. So like it, it, so basically like if when the players arrive at the factory, you can just flip open the book and show the art that um, Jason Bradley Thompson did of the characters arriving at the factory. And it's like, rather than going out of your way to describe or to have a whole bunch of text saying, Oh, this is what the factory looks like. So just like here, show your players this. That's what they see taken care of it. And you've done it in a way that can provide far more information than you could like spew out of your mouth by reading over two paragraphs. Um, And And, and in terms of, in terms of the ultimate picture worth a thousand words, you guys have in there, uh, one of those sort of isometric walkthrough pictures that the guy did oh for God, yeah. horrors and for you know all of the classic adventures. He's mm-hmm. done one for Blood in the Chocolate too. So it, it is. Oh my God! So I have been extremely fortunate and just utterly blessed to have amazing artists uh, do things for Blood in the Chocolate, like uh, Jason Bradley Thompson, uh, who goes by Mockman online. Um, you can go to a site, Mockman, uh, I believe it's Mockman.press or Mockmanpress.com. Um, his work is incredible. He's a comics artist, but he does these amazing walkthrough maps for, he does, he's done a lot of them for classic D&D modules, and he's done a bunch for Lamentations of the Flame Princess at this point. And they're sort of like family circus style dotted line walkthroughs of dungeons showing the past that the pl- that the player characters make and where they die horribly along the way and the one for blend the chocolate is so good and i love it so much because it's just like it is the perfect encapsulation of playing through that module and just having the most ridiculous time with it it's so good yeah he really really is uh is, is- gifted at those i mean i looked at his his one for uh tome of horrors and i was like yep that's uh, mm-hmm. the tomb of tomb of horrors and i'm like yep that's tomb of horrors and he did one for uh barrier peaks and i was like yep that's barrier peaks he's really good at uh at conveying the the shit that goes on <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah well it's also and he's really good at and it fits with lamentation so well um like he has a small army of player characters go through that and only a, like one or two of them make it out. But like, that is sort of an, an undervalued aspect of the game is just sort of like coming out the other end of one of these adventures with just a few people left and all of the just amazing deaths along the way. Yeah. The, uh, that I, 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 that I agree. I think that's a um, an underappreciated value. You know, when you do have very very lethal adventures, the uh, the culmination of a few people walking out, hopefully, you know, dragging everybody else out for a mm-hmm. raised dead spell or something like that. But um, this this idea that you uh, you know that you actually were winnowed down over the course of things. Mm-hmm. Um, is I think something that's um, under, underappreciated and probably underappreciated even in the old school gaming community that you know people talk about lethality um, of games and I'm like it's not about the lethality of it it's about the it, the things that the potential for lethality um, what it's it's the effects of mm-hmm. that that are more important to it than just, I killed a lot of players. I'm, therefore I'm, you know, a totally old school DM. It's like, no, you, but if you have only a few of your guys, you know, uh, dragging everybody else out at the end, you know, you've, uh, you know, there you've taken an advantage of, of, of something. Um, mm. one of the pictures in the old, uh, I guess it was in the Holmes basic book was people, you know, waving as they got to the dungeon exit and everyone, yeah. everyone does dungeon entrances, but you really know what's going on. If you're showing them the characters at the dungeon exit being real yeah. happy. There's, there's a handful of, of art that James Radji commissioned for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Um, there are two that come to mind. One is um, three of his iconic characters. Um, I believe it's, uh, I think it's Flame Princess, Alice, and I think it's Attain, uh, but I'm not certain, uh, because it's this one of, like, the three of them limping away from a dungeon, like, all smiles while they are just 
utterly brutal and beaten and like uh like terribly hurt like some of them are missing limbs others have their their arms in slings uh Etain is just like covered in slime um they're bloody and battered but of course Etain is also dragging this uh uh, sort of cart or this skiff or something that is just piled with treasure. And it's this wonderful image, and it's just like, that's what walking away from an LOTFP adventure is like. Like, you did it, you made it, you lost so much along the way, but hopefully you came out the other end with something just as good, or you are substantially richer now. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I like the uh the sort of theme in that so okay so you're working on a a wave crawl anything mm -hmm. else that's up at that level on your priority list or is that the main thing that you're working on right now um that's the thing that's taking up most of my attention at the time um i've got a couple other books sort of in the works um i don't know how much i can talk about them because they haven't been finalized through contracts yet um i have an hopefully another book through Lamentations of the Flying Princess officially. Um, no idea when it's going to come out. N not really a good idea of when it'll be finished, but I've been working on it until now. Um, if I get my way, and I hope I do, um, I'm going to be doing a, a really big supplement that is, I hope, the definitive take for role-playing games on Dante's Inferno. Oh, okay, and that uh, hasn't really been tried since the very early days with Judges Guild's Inferno. Yeah. Uh, the book is called book is tentatively called Depths of the Inferno, and it is an a uh, sort of an air quotes official uh, Catholic hell for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Um, and in, in doing it, it provides a um, sort of an alternative to the total party kill, like when you're playing a bunch of characters and everyone dies. And to replace it, it's like, well, okay, well, now what do we do? We can roll up, we, we have to roll up new characters and try again. And like, yeah, sometimes that sucks, especially if you're attached to these characters. What I hope to do with this book is provide an alternative where, okay, yeah, everybody died. Well, now you have a choice. You can make new people or you show up in hell at like the beginning of things about to be judged and about to be sort of like sent on your way uh, through the nine circles. Um, and there is the possibility, because again, Dante posits that hell is a literal physical place um, it, that exists underground. Um, there is the possibility of escaping uh, hell and damnation and returning to life. Uh, you might not return out the stronger for it, but there is the possibility of return. With um, treasure. Yeah, uh, that's that's one thing we're sort of we're sort of playing around with is <laughs> like not not using hell as an excuse to like well if we die we can just get stronger and get like super buff and jacked up and like come out the other side of hell richer like that doesn't a that wouldn't jive well with uh, Dante Alighieri's actual conception of hell uh, and b that feels like something that would be exploited by players. Um, so it's, it's, we're sort of working around uh, that to sort of make it still engaging and worth doing, but something that isn't going to mean like you come out the other end of hell, like totally swole and, and like ready to take on the world even stronger than you were before, because uh, that doesn't seem like hell. I don't know. I don't have a whole lot else. Go I mean, I've got the, the games that I run and uh, the games that I play in. Um, because like you can't design a whole bunch of game stuff without actually playing a whole bunch as well. Sure. Do you play at a real tabletop or a virtual tabletop? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I have a home game group in Toronto that I play with. They mostly like D and D Fifth Edition, so I run that, and it's a really good time. Um, I'm a really big fan of Fifth Edition thus far. Um, I run uh, um, I run some five E and some old school stuff online. Um, I run a a very new school game that actually feels very old school online for uh, my partner. Um, she wanted me to run a one on one game with her uh, based in Ravenloft. Um, and, but of course, it's uh, with the character that she plays. Like, I've uh, made it much more about sort of 
um, sort of drama and character interaction and exploration. And I've stripped out basically almost every instance of combat and replaced it with cooking challenges oh. um, because her main character is a chef and the NPC sort of air quotes hireling that she has along with her is like a sous chef. Um, and that might seem very silly, but at the same time, it has created uh, challenges and situations that feel way more old school than a lot of like dungeon crawls that I've played in. Mm -hmm. um, because they suddenly require a huge amount of like resource gathering and improvisation and basically making the best out of a bad situation when suddenly it's like, oh, we got to make this this meal for this one person and we have we only have these ingredients to work with. And it's like, um, like famously from one of my games, she, um, I, I should say this person is uh, Arella. She runs the Tumblr um, bardicchef.tumblr.com where she's sort of Tumblr famous for um, uh, a situation in my game where uh, she beat the main villain of a vampire campaign by making a garlic filled cake. Nice. And with mostly using like blood and body parts and having to cobble together um, baking ingredients from what was around her and using literally every detail on everyone's character sheets and the rules of the game to like, shoot, how do I get this like one ingredient to set properly? Uh, okay, wait, no, you have uh, a cold spell and everything. Okay, we can use that to create a cold surface to be able to have that set on there, which it says, okay, you have this weapon, you might be able to use that sideways to roll it out to like crush this ingredient so we have it as a powder and and also like using like self mutilating to be able to get blood and body parts and everything. And then using parts of cadavers because these are cakes for vampires. Sure. Yeah. Um, so all of them involve blood. It's ridiculous and so detailed and wonderful. And essentially we've kind of made an entire game around that now. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, it, it, you can look it up on Tumblr. Uh, it's called five courses of Strahd. Um, oh, okay. So we, this is on. This is online. I, uh, excellent. Yeah, oh, I yeah. thought you. I thought you were saying that this was just the, you know, the private thing that the two of you guys uh, were doing, and the story should up. So you've actually got this online. Well, you can't watch it online, but we have like uh, session recaps and like art and um, like fan responses that we've gotten from it. Okay. Say and so say again where they can find it. Um, on Tumblr, you can just look up five courses of Strahd. Um, it's also tagged on my own blog, uh, Dungeons and Donuts. Um, you can look through the tags there to see both of our responses from it. Okay, excellent. So, I think we've got a lot of people, a lot of places for people to uh, uh, to go and look at. And then, um, if you'll, you know, message me all of the links that we oh, talked yeah. about, so that I can hot link them at the bottom. Um, let's go ahead and pull it to a close. So, say goodbye to your fans. Goodbye, fans. <laughs> Everybody always is like, what? When I say that, most people don't realize they have fans. Um, and I'll say to all of my folks that, uh, you know, no matter what sort of D&D &D that it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.